was never going to be another war that bad. And it was called the Great War. And then the last one, that's a President Woodrow Wilson term, to make the world safe for democracy. Um, he really thought that, you know, he was going to go down as the greatest president in history as making a lasting peace that would be there forever. Um, I mentioned there was a family feud. If you look at the major players here, on the Allied side, you see you've got Russia, Great Britain, Italy, and France. On the Central Power side, who would be our enemies once we eventually entered the war, you've got Germany, Turkey, and Austria-Hungary. Well, three of these guys were cousins. Um, you can see there that um, George of Britain, Nicholas of Russia, and Wilhelm of Germany, they all look very, very similar. And they're all grandchildren of Queen Victoria. So it is ironic that these three guys, at least I know for sure, Wilhelm and George of Britain, were riding beside each other in George's father's funeral three years before the war started, and then now they're bitter enemies ready to take each other out. Um, we're going to talk about four long-term causes for the war. The first one I've got here is the alliance system. Um, we've talked about alliances before, but it's a formal agreement between nations. Um, the United States have a lot, has a lot of alliances today. Um, two big ones in Europe at the time I've got there, the Triple Entente, who would be the allies in the Triple Alliance, or the Central Powers, and those are the countries we just listed. Um, but for long-term causes, I want you to recognize nationalism, imperialism, militarism, and the alliance system. Nationalism is a word we've seen several times in U.S. history so far, but it's when you have a feeling of pride in your country. Um, you saw a lot of nationalism after September 11th with the stickers and cars, kind of like you see on the screen right there. Um, at this point, we're talking about nationalism in particular in thing, places like France and Germany where Germans were taught to hate the French and the French were taught to hate the Germans because those two countries had been at odds with each other for over a hundred years and about every generation went through a war. Imperialism is something we just spent several about a week and a half on, so I don't think I need to really un explain this again, but we know it's when a stronger country dominates a weaker nation. And you look at this slide, the European powers were starting to be imperialist too. We focused on imperialism from the United States, you know, taking over Hawaii, getting involved in the Spanish-American War, um, then eventually kind of dominating the Philippines, Puerto Rico, places like that. But if you look at that map, um, Africa was kind of split up like a pie at the Berlin Conference in 1888, and the European countries started grabbing everything they could in Africa. They've been grabbing everything they could in China. And you can see there they're going down the west coast of Brazil as well. So you look at all that bright orange on the map is imperialist areas from controlled by central powers, while the lighter beige is imperialist areas controlled by neutral states. But the dark green, which you can see you got a dark green swath all across Africa, was controlled by the Entente, or what would become our allies. And, you know, at one point Britain had a north to south corridor in Africa. All right, our next big long-term call is going to be militarism, where every country felt like they had the need to build a big military because every other country did. If you've been paying attention to the news the last couple of days, you've been paying attention to what happened with North Korea and South Korea, or what's been happening, may, may be happening. And those two countries kind of build up a strong military because they feel like they need protection from the other. Well, that's how this was. You know, France decides they need a strong military because Germany has one. And then Russia decides they need one because France and Germany both have one. Um, Britain at this time actually had a two power theory where they were determined to have a navy at least as large as the next two strongest powers combined. Um, so it's kind of like everybody's spoiling for a fight. Everybody's waiting for something to happen. Um, if you look at these increases in military expenditures, you look at from 1870, every decade they're listed up to 1914, um, countries knew that something was coming. And they spent millions, that little funny symbol there is millions of pounds getting ready for some big fight. Um, and if you look there, Germany's the leader in the, uh, increasing their defense expenditures. All right, but if you look at Europe in 1914 there, um, Germany will see that once the war started was faced with fighting a two-front war, where they had to fight France on their western front and Russia on their eastern front, so they were kind of fighting the uphill battle from the very beginning of the war. And you see that all the pink countries are neutral states. Well, if you look right there in the middle there, you got Switzerland right above Italy. 
Um, Switzerland's neutral in most wars. But if you look at their location, the size of that country, they're in a pretty precarious spot if they were to come out on one side or the other. Well, all those that we just talked about were long-term causes of the war. The actual spark that starts the war right away is going to be the assassination of Austria's Archduke. That's Franz Ferdinand. He's visiting Sarajevo, Bosnia. A Serbian nationalist named Gabriel Princip steps from the crowd, shoots him and his wife. He's a member of an organization called the Black Hand. And if you look right here, there's a picture of Gabriel Princip. Um, he's being arrested right there. The Archduke and his wife were riding in an open-air car. But this was just the one spark that really a lot of diplomats let them lead this into war. There's an interesting book by a lady named Barbara Tushman um, called The Guns of August about how all these European leaders made a lot of mistakes in their diplomatic efforts after this, and everybody was just kind of spoiling for a fight, and that's what leads into World War I. Um, but I've got here that the alliance system is what draws a lot of Europe into the war. As a result of this, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Um, the Balkans were a powder keg at this time. They were ready to explode at any time because there were a lot of people that felt like they should have their own independent state that were controlled by places like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is why that assassination took place to begin with. All right, well then Germany had a treaty with Austria-Hungary, so they declared war on Russia because Russia is supposed to be the defender of Slavic peoples. Then you see the next bullet point. Germany also declared war on France because they were Russia's ally. And then Germany decided to invade France. When they did this, they invaded through Belgium. So then England jumps into the war because England was supposed to defend Belgium's neutrality. So it's kind of like if a big fight in the hallway starts because somebody pushes somebody. And they say, well, that's my boy, so I'm going to jump in. And somebody else says, well, that's my friend that you pushed, so I'm going to jump in. And all of a sudden, you have a world war start from this one little spark in the Balkans. And if you look at this side, uh, you know, Germany takes a lot of the blame for World War I. And we'll see why when we finish talking about World War I with the um, Treaty of Versailles. But really, you could make a pretty solid case for saying that just about any European country that took a major role in this war was to blame. Um, I had my AP European class several years ago do an essay assignment where they had to talk about who was to blame for World War I. And people presented some pretty interesting cases for France, for Germany, for Russia, um, for Great Britain. So it's not a very clear-cut answer for who started this war or why did it begin. All right, now if you look at this slide, um, one thing I want to point out to you is Italy. I don't want to confuse you because on one of my other slides I had that Italy's with the Allies, and Italy was with the Allies um, once the U.S. joined the war. They came over to the Allied side. All right, that's a picture. If you've seen the movie All Quiet on the Western Front, you saw a lot of soldiers wearing helmets like that. Um, that would spike on top of the helmet was uh, symbolic of the German helmets. But I mentioned that Germany invaded Belgium to attack France. Well, Germany had been planning for war for years. It's not like the assassination of the Archduke happens and then all of a sudden there's like dominoes falling down where they say, well, let's get ready to fight quickly. Germany had been planning for years what they were going to do. And they knew they might have to fight, um, fight excuse me, Russia and France at the same time. So their idea is to take France out quickly, and then turn and focus their attention on Russia so they don't have a two-front war. Um, this is created by a guy named Alfred von Schleifen, who was out of the German military by this time. He was retired. But the thinking was that Paris, excuse me, they attacked through to Paris. They could knock out France because France could mobilize quicker. Russia had a lot more territory to cover, so it was going to be at least two weeks later after the war was officially on that they thought Russia would be ready to fight. They called this M14. Like they thought Russia would be ready to fight by the 14th day. They tried to mobilize their army. So I start using that um, terminology, like M14, M2. That's how many days after a country begins to mobilize, they're ready to fight. So you look there, that's Germany's plan. The Schleifen plan, they actually said they wanted to have their right flank sweep the English Channel. And this was maybe good in theory for the Germans, but once they actually started what was to be called trench warfare, it didn't work out in practice. You can see that picture has got a guy crouching in a trench that looks like it's got basically a creek on the bottom of it, a bunch of mud. Um, when the Germans invade France, they start this long trench warfare where you might fight for months and get 100 yards, or you might fight, get a few miles, but it's basically long rows of ditches facing each other with usually things like barbed wire 
put up in front of them. Um, I've got there that between them lay a no man's land. Obviously, no man's land because you attack and then get out of there because you hang around long there. You're going to get shot. And this diagram of a trench shows what they could look like. You see, they would put sandbags on the top of the trenches. They put barbed wire in front of the trenches. And they would have little dugouts in the trenches where soldiers could sleep. But, you know, sometimes they might be in a dugout, hit by a bomb and killed, or they might lay out in the open and survive a bombardment. You know, a lot of that was kind of left to chance. Um, one di big difference, though, about trench warfare and guys who had to fight in conditions like this versus the Civil War, you know, that was our last real major war we talked about, not counting the Spanish-American War. In the Civil War, the soldiers kind of rested at night. They would even sometimes trade paper, trade coffee, like newspapers, or coffee back and forth across the lines with other soldiers from the other side. World War I, you didn't get that rest at night. World War I was a lot more psychologically taxing because all night long, the two sides were shelling each other. Um, so soldiers never really got a good night's rest. And as a result of World War I, we have what we term today shell shock, or they term shell shock. Today we would call it post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but, you know, this is a U.S. history class, so we are focusing on what America's role in this was. And at the start, there was no American role in this war. Americans didn't really see a need to jump into a war that was in Europe. And a lot of this goes back to Americans were still kind of following the precedent set by George Washington with his farewell address. Um, you know, Washington's farewell address, he said two important things. He said, one, watch out for the political parties. Well, we already dropped the ball on that one because he said they could be divisive, and they were. And two, he said, stay away from entangling foreign alliances. So while Europe was getting sucked into the alliance system, Americans were not. And we'll see when we talk about the home front how a lot of Americans were trying to stay very isolationist, and this isolationist means keep us to ourselves feeling increased after World War One as well. And also, if we did jump in the war, it wasn't clear-cut whose side we would jump in on. A lot of Americans had ancestors on both sides of the fight. But eventually, American loyalties were tied to our economic loyalties and trade. And we had a lot stronger economic ties to the Allies than to the Central Powers. And actually, you can ignore that graph, page 583. That's an old version of the textbook. But Great Britain realized that they needed to stop Germany from having any kind of economic advantage through trade with another country, so they blockaded the German coastline. Remember, I said that Britain was a very strong naval power since they had had that two-power theory. Well, in response to this, the Germans start sinking any British or Allied ships with U-boats, um, which are submarines. Um, this is not the first time submarines are used in warfare. Submarines actually have gone all the way back to the War of 1812, and the Civil War, they actually had submarines where you had eight guys in it where they would turn a hand crank to turn the propeller, and they would have to basically ram the ship and hope that the ship sunk and they could back away from the ship before it sunk so they didn't get tied in with it as it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Now they've got submarines by World War I that can actually shoot torpedoes at ships. Well, one ship they sunk really almost brought the U.S. into the war on the side of the Allies. The Lusitania was a British passenger liner that was sunk by a German U-boat, which killed about 128 Americans and almost 1,200 people total. But this really turned American opinion against Germany. But while the Germans, you know, it could, you could look at this and say, well, that's wrong. They sunk this passenger liner. This passenger liner was also beneath the decks carrying um, contraband or things that we were using to assist the British during the war. Um, so the U.S. protested. The Germans promised they weren't sinking any more passenger ships. This promise didn't hold true, but it kept us out of the war right then. Um, you know, while the war is going on, we still have politics as usual in the United States. And if you look at that button with Woodrow Wilson's face on it, you can see it says safety first, kind of implying that he's going to keep Americans safe. Um, Woodrow Wilson's campaign slogan in 1916 against um, Supreme Court Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes was, that he kept us out of war, kind of applying to Americans, elect Wilson, and we'll stay out of World War I. Well, again, it wasn't called World War I at that point. We'll stay out of this European conflict. Well, that didn't hold. Um, we eventually entered the war after the German Kaiser, that's Kaiser Wilhelm, that guy we looked at earlier who was a cousin of the British and Russian leaders. Um, he called for unrestricted submarine warfare. And there was another reason we jumped in. You can see there the Zimmermann note. It was a telegram sent from um, Germany to its ambassador in Mexico telling the, him to tell the Mexican government that if Mexico would help Germany fight the United States, 
then Germany would help Mexico regain that territory lost in the Mexican session after the Mexican War. So that would be like California, New Mexico, um, Arizona.